The word star is vastly overused in music, and at the risk of offending others, I can count on one hand the number of true stars who've appeared on Key View. When a rare opportunity presented itself, allowing me to talk to an artist whose musical CV makes your jaw drop, I didn't need to be asked twice. He's back in the UK for who knows how short a time, and whilst I pull up a chair in his temporary Cheshire home and keep you in suspense a little longer, here he is in action. <laughs> A 
great jazz style to trust in me, and it really is a great pleasure to welcome the one and only Alan Haven to Key View. Alan, before we um, talk about your life at the keyboards, I ought to say that I chose that track because on a much earlier LP from the British organist Jimmy Smith, he dedicated his arrangement of Trust in Me to, uh, and I quote, My friend Alan Haven, without doubt one of the finest players of all time, from whom I have gained so much inspiration. When fellow professionals start to dedicate things to you, does it make you feel as though you've become a star? No, it worries me like mad. <laughs> I think they'll have to tap him for five <laughs> it, it must be a nice feeling, though, I guess. Of course. Uh, there's nothing better to be appreciated by fellow musicians because they do what you do. They do they're, they're doing the same thing. And, of course, it's, it's, it's not an honour, but it's very gratifying. Mm. And it's, it's, it's nice. Let's talk about the early days. When, when did you first decide, uh, or maybe even what convinced you to, uh, to look at music as a profession? The first time I got through chopsticks, unaided. I don't know really. I, there was a piano in the front room at home, it, it was that sort of scene, and I just started messing around on piano and, and I finished up playing the piano. And it was, I suppose I was about late teens, 17, 18, before I took any formal serious education. I was actually gigging, out gigging, playing with a, with a, with a small group uh, before I actually... And, and that was because I wanted to know what I was doing. I was playing chords without me knowing it that were quite important and other musicians were coming up and asking me, what chord is that? You know, how'd you get that? And I didn't know. My hobby's always been chords, harmonic structure. And I was being asked about the chords I was playing, but I didn't think there was anything, you know, they're just the chords. I'd find them and play and make these progressions. So to cut a long story short, I went to uh, Manchester College of Music. for. A, I took a six-month course with a Professor O'Neill, wonderful Scottish guy and uh, very, very good. And really to take theory and harmony. So to know what I was doing, to put a name to these chords and to be able to, and then to be able to to arrange and because when I first went in and when I first played he said what are you doing here <laughs> he was tremendous he couldn't understand why so I, I explained he was quite surprised you know that I could do all this but really had very little knowledge of what I was doing myself and it was a case of uh, just learning the the theory and harmony mm. of music weren't talking of um, electronics 
back then, and, and, and digital really was, I suppose, pure science fiction. Oh, oh no. it, it was the electric yeah, organ, wasn't yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that made waves, and names like Hammond, and obviously, in, in your case, Lowry. Lowry. Yeah. Um, you know more about me than me. <laughs> I've yeah. done the research, you yeah, know. Yeah, no, you know more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> these, these were tools of the trade, weren't That's they? That's right. Um, and what, though in those days, you, you couldn't get them. I mean... Uh, Hammonds used to have to be specially imported at hugely inflated prices full of tax and import duty and Lord knows what. And uh, then suddenly, the, for some reason, I can't remember, the trade barriers came down and then all these organs came into the country and I got a phone call from a couple of friends of mine that used to run a music shop in uh, Bolton. Harker and Howe, Tom Harker. Yeah, lovely pair of guys. And uh, they phoned me and said, we've got this Lowry organ just come in from America. We're importing these now. We've become an agent. And I went, by this time I was quite hooked on organ. I'd heard a man called Jackie Davis who really blew me away. I thought, I still think he's one of the greatest organ players of all time. Tremendous. I don't know where he is now. I don't know if he's still with us or not. There's, there's people don't know if I'm still with us. <laughs> <laughs> you you talked about a poor departed gentleman when you introduced me. Funny, I'll tell you something funny. This is true. I recently, like last year or the year before, went into the, the Guinness Encyclopedia of Popular Music. Did you know that? I'm next to on, I'm on the same page as Richie Havens. <laughs> so no, this is true. The surprise to me was I thought you had to be dead before they did that. <laughs> I didn't know that you could do that while you're still alive. <laughs> It's quite a long story short, I just plunged whatever pennies I had and decided I'm going to buy this damn thing. And, uh, and I stuck myself, rented a little room in, in a warehouse and stuck myself away and just determined to get round because I was a piano player. And of course, the most foreign part of it was, I mean, apart from the difference with the two manuals, which you can soon get the hang of, but the really foreign bit was the, was the leg, of course. But I was determined, I mean, I eventually became known quite seriously known for my pedalling. But uh, initially it was, uh, what the hell is this, you know? And, uh, but I stuck with it. And I had some very good friends. Luckily, I, w I was in Bolton at the time. I was playing at the Bolton Pally. And in town working at a local theatre bar was a very fine, fine old-time organist, Charles Smith. Remember Charlie? Yeah, great guy. We became very good mates, and he was an a terrific lot of help. You get the right person, you know, they can cut so many, cut off so many corners, give you so many shortcuts. And he was a very big help. Very lucky when you got somebody like that. Uh, great player, great player. Actually, Charles could swing, but regardless of what kind of music... I only know two kinds of music. In the world, I know two kinds of music, good and bad. That's all I know. Not interested in labels, jazz, schmazz, this, swing, bop. Look at the name jazz, I mean, what a silly word. Um. That one word is supposed to encompass anything from Bix Beiderbecke to Stan Kenton through Bayes. How impossible. Sadly, today, there is an awful lot of junk in music. I know that the popular music scene, if you like, mm. turned from music to media heavily some years ago. To their detriment, the record companies have not helped, and, it's, and they're feeling the bad side of it now. Uh, they're, they're seeing it in reflecting. So, you know, the, the major record labels always at one time, they always had their pop music, but they also supported fringe music and... Mm quality music, be it classical, be it uh, what you'd call minority interest. And the whole, the, the description, minority interest music, for, and uh, today is, a, a, a huge thing has happened, of course, with the internet. It's opened up a whole world of, you, you know, you've got whatever it is, I don't know, 600 million, 1,200 million, 1,000 million, I don't know how many it is, at any one moment surfing the net. So, nowadays... What's a minority product? You know, with, with that market, you, 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 if you get 0.0000001% of the market, you could, you could be selling an awful lot of records. 
this is a new thing. This has opened up something to artists, musicians they never had before. The record companies had the stranglehold. They had the stranglehold through a thing called distribution. <laughs> Alan, many organists and keyboard players who um, cut their teeth on valves and Leslie's often say to me, it's not like it was in the old days. If if they're right, how come you've clearly retained enthusiasm for and skill with modern keyboard ideas? I started with a synthesizer years ago. I think I was one of the first... I think I was one of the first in this country... To, uh, to use this one of the first ARP synths, which looked, was a thing that looked like a telephone exchange. <laughs> I used to take it on stage with me and <laughs> sit plugging plugs in and out. <laughs> People used to wonder what I thought I was working the lights. You know? <laughs> I've always embraced technology, but always, I hope, musically. And, uh, and I still do. And for me, what has happened has been miraculous. I used to dream at one time, though not dream, because you never even thought it a possibility, but I used to imagine, wasn't it wonderful? You know, if you could create your own whole orchestra, and to a degree, an organ was a little bit that you could get closer, but it was never quite the same, obviously. And I always treated an organ as an organ, not as a, 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 an imitator of an orchestra or a band. I always treated it as an organ. Yes, I'm quite happy to bring in the strings if they're good and they sound good. Great. The first drum units were a disaster. I mean, they were, they, were, they, were, they were just horrible. Now, of course, everything that's on any kind of electronic music is incredible. You buy the, the, the most basic home little keyboard and the sound. But, of course, you're listening to samples. Samples of, the, I mean, the drum kits on these things now are phenomenal. Everything is just, the sound is phenomenal. And you can now, literally, and I do, you can sit in a bedroom and do a whole movie score. And people do. People in Hollywood sit doing with the John Williamses and people can sit doing just that. Uh, you can create a whole orchestra. You, I, you can push a button and you've got the Carnegie Hall Steinway perfectly, beautifully recorded in full stereo. All there on your keyboard at your fingertips. You can pull up a 40-piece string section. So there's no... We don't talk about synthesised sounds anymore because they're not. So the synthesised sounds today are the sounds, the sound of the real sound. It's a keyboard player's world in a way. I mean, it's uh, it's been quite tough over the last few years. On, uh... So I'll tell you a funny story. My old drummer, one of my very first old, a great jazz drummer who sadly died not long ago, Tony Crombie. And I met up with Tony a few years ago after having not seen him for quite a few years. I'd been abroad. He'd gone to Portugal for some reason. I didn't know whether he'd gone to live, but he'd gone there for an extended stay and then he'd come back. And he was 
bemoaning the state of the business. And he was saying how, how bad it was now. Even like all the top session players who you couldn't get, you used to have to book like the Stan Roderick, Stan Reynolds, the top trumpet session. You wanted them for a session. You had to book them like three months. Has now you can, you can phone up and you can get who you want. You know that even the session scene's gone. Like then there was this sort of pregnant pause. And he said, "Thank Christ, I'm not one of the top players." <laughs> And I should think that uh, our listeners are going to find that pretty hard to believe that what we've just heard there, HRH, in the style of the uh, the Count Basie Orchestra, was done lock, stock and barrel by yourself, hands and feet and a lot of blood, sweat and tears, I should imagine. Um, t- tell us about the, the concept and the amount of work that's actually gone into the production of this new big band album. I wanted to complement what... I wanted to be able to recreate those bands with today's sound quality the recording technology and techniques we've got today and marry it with the Hammond organ sound and uh, that was what it was about it just took about 
maybe 10 to 20 times longer than I first envisaged the idea first hit, I suppose. I first got in touch with Gary. He was in uh, Orlando, in Florida. It would be oh, maybe two, two, two and a half years ago. A funny thing, he's got a huge website uh, devoted to the big bands and the shows and the... And he makes these MIDI files, and he's got this enormous big, which gets a huge number of hits. And, uh, but he's a chef in all, in Orlando, by, yeah, by profession. He's a, a, ter- a tenor player, uh, but he's a big band nut. He loves the big band there, but by profession he's a chef. And he just does this thing because he, he loves making the MIDI files of the big bands. <laughs> the results you've heard, and I think you'll agree that they're, they're worthwhile. I've created a sound that now doesn't do any dis doesn't do any any injustice to the Basie band to the Ellington. I respect these people so much that what I did I, had to be right for me as well. What I had to do was get into editing each of the horns, either the saxes, the trumpets. So, so what I did, I I like changed the timbre the tone quality of each trumpet. Each trumpet's on a different track. I've got, like, say, four or five tr- trumpets in the section. So, and now, I've got to make them sound real. I've got to get rid of this sort of synthetic sound. Each trumpet gets a different... Just like a real guy. They all have a different tone. So I altered the tone quality of each one. I altered the... I gave each one a, a slightly different vibrato speed a slightly different vibrato depth. Uh, One trumpet approaching the note a bit different, you know, each trumpet hits a note slightly differently, give the attack of the trumpet a slight difference, maybe one with a slight gliss, a little tiny gliss. The result, I was very happy with. Having said that, it, it turned easier as I went along because I learnt as I was going along quicker ways just by doing it I became quicker but I also almost sort of built myself little templates as I was going along to be able to quickly introduce things it wasn't as as painful as doing the first one the first one was the steep learning curve
I've been very lucky through my career. I got to work with and meet great people. I worked with. I made the, the last album with my, one of my favourite tenor players in the world, Ben Webster, who to me is like was just magic. And I was on the last album he made before he died. Funny that seems to happen to a lot of people that I work with. <laughs> and Stefan Grappelli, I, uh, people like this that I did work with, uh, and diverse people, Jimi Hendrix in his own way, and I did sessions thing. I worked with John Barry on, on movies, I did the the Knack, uh, Russia with Love, the Bond things and stuff. You know, you know. So it's been pretty diverse, and, and, and I'm all the happier for it. I've, been, I've, I've got my sniff in to film music and stuff, and, you know. It must seem, though, at, at this point in your esteemed, and that, that is the right word, esteemed career, what else is there left to do? The lottery would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, really. It's, uh, I'm just doing what I'm doing. I'm now into this sort of recreating big bands and sitting myself in hammered organs with them. And uh, I want to get it. I'm, I'll be doing some, some shows and stuff around, you know. Over the years, I've made, I suppose, I don't know, must be 12, 15 albums. And, uh, and then I worked a lot of great, great, trumpet player Maynard Ferguson that name will probably mean something who's since became a very good mate and I saw him recently in America we were walking down Sunset Boulevard and I suddenly see a big poster Maynard Ferguson on the campus at the local university doing it on Sunday afternoon oh I said to Karen we've got to get some of that because you know I hadn't seen him for ages and we, came, we became very good mate he guested on one of my albums but I, div I, I digress a little but I was doing the only album I ever did with a big live orchestra was Haven for Sale. Remember that thing with. And uh, Keith Mansfield was the arranger for this. I did it with the trio, and then he arranged the orchestra. We did the trio bits, and then he, we were dubbing the orchestra on afterwards. When I turned up for the orchestra sessions, he came to me and said, Oh, I've got bad news. The normal lead trumpet I always book, I couldn't get. He's not well, and uh, I couldn't get him for the session. So, uh, I'm sure it'll be okay, but I've got a guy coming. I don't know what he's like. I know nothing about him. I've just had to take whoever I could get. And I'm thinking, you know, I finally, I, CBS had backed this big orchestra with strings and the whole, like, 50-piece orchestra. And, uh, and I really wanted this to be good. I made Oliver Ferguson walk through. I couldn't believe it. I thought, you son of a <laughs> And he just came to blow... Lead trumpet on the band. He wasn't looking for anything, no credits, no pay, no, just to do it for me. I thought, wow, you know. And didn't he give that band a kick up the backside? Boy, did he make it move. What a unbelievable. But this is musicians. Alan, thanks for, for, for spending an inordinate amount of time oh, it's a with, pleasure. with me today. Pleasure. It's been great to meet you, really. And uh, to end with, let's have a listen to uh, just one of your many, many hits, Alan. This is um, Image and Alan Haven. Thank you for joining me on the programme. <laughs>
Image with Alan Haven on Wersey Beat Organ and DX7 Yamaha Synth with vocals from Alan's partner Karen L.